Good afternoon. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention very briefly? Um, welcome to welcome to uh, another Net Impact uh, Backup Professional Chapter meeting uh, organized by the Sutton Center for Sustainability Management. Um, it's very nice to see a lot of new faces and certainly some of our some some of the members who who been around since the early days are now back. So so welcome welcome back um, and. Uh, Today, um, we're very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Michael Schaffer, the founder and director of the Warm Heart Foundation. Um, Michael's trained uh, uh, in government, PhD from Harvard, and spent 25 years teaching political science at Rutgers University and consulting in areas of international development, community uh, recreation after conflict, and recreation. Recreation, sorry. <laughs> recreation. <laughs> and uh, higher education reform. He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and a 21st Century Fellow. Um, 2008, uh, he and his wife started Warm Heart, uh, a community um, development organization serving Northern Thailand. Um, Dr. Schaff is also the founder and president of Second Harvest Power Company um, in Thailand, a startup green power um, company, uh, which will soon build its first agricultural waste-fired community power plant. So without further ado, uh, a big welcome, and uh, uh, I hand over to, to Michael. Thank you very much. I, I am here only for the purposes of recording. This is the smallest classroom I think I've dealt with in a very long time. So um, I'm really glad to be here. And it is literally community re recreation, not recreation. Um, I used to work in places like you know, the ex-Yugoslavia and, and, and had to get people who had been enthusiastically killing each other shortly before to sit in the same room and try and figure out how they were now going to live together. But I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, because um, I, I'm sort of a maverick within the NGO world, and I really am, I'm a total do-gooder at heart, but I have a very different notion of what CSR should be than, than, than most people in the NGO world. I am absolutely opposed to charity and to the philanthropy model, and I really think that you, as representatives of the business community, need to be thinking about CSR as investment, because down at the base of the pyramid, we really need you to be making innovative and strategic investments with a long-term profit motivation to be in our communities, okay? I live in one of the most beautiful places in the world, and I'm not one of those NGO people who lives in a nice city, in a nice apartment that has a big white um, SUV and sort of commutes occasionally to projects. My wife and I live 50 meters away from our children's homes, we work in our microenterprise projects. I go up the mountains. I plant coffee myself. I mean, we live in an absolutely gorgeous place. The look, you know, it's great to go up the mountains. It's great to look down from the mountains, but the roads don't go anywhere. Okay, three to five months of the year, you cannot go up to our mountain villages because of the rain. These are two kids we're actually raising right now. But I can tell you, in the mountain villages, there is no place to go. And in the villages of the lowlands, there's also no place to go. So a third of the population lives below the Thai national poverty line. Um, there are no jobs. There are just plain and simply no jobs. For at least five months of the year, two thirds of the adult population of our entire district leaves to get jobs in other parts of the country. And I will tell you, most of those people who don't become prostitutes go down to Sokla to work in the shrimp ponds. And if any of you want an operational definition of the worst job you have ever had in your life, go down to Sokla and look at a shrimp pond. Because wading up and down in water that is a slurry of shrimp, shrimp food, and shrimp shit is the single worst job I can imagine in the world. And because there are no jobs, this is where all of our young people end up. 
13 years old, you finish sixth grade, you go down to Chiang Mai, you go down to Pattaya, you go down to um, Phuket, and so on, and you're poor. Boys and girls. Who gets left behind? A handful of women who are selected to take care of the kids, and a lot of grandmas. They bear the burden of the poverty. Because during the five months, or 10 months, or 12 months, that all of the adult males and most of the adult females are away working, they take care of the grandparents. They take care of the disabled. They take care of the kids. They take care of the kids who were born in the cities and sent home to be taken care of. And no money comes home from the cities. It's expensive to be a construction worker here in Bangkok. There's not a lot left over. When you're getting paid 200 baht a day to work on a construction site, you don't have a lot of money to send home. These people live on nothing, okay? We are typical of Northern Thailand. Northern Thailand, I mean, you, you think about Thailand, it's statistically a middle-income developing country. That is simply by virtue of the fact that people use the mean to calculate middle income. There is a huge amount of money here, but there's a fantastic income inequality. Thailand has a terrible Gini index. It is by far and away the most unequal distribution of income in its, peer, in its peer group. The result of which is that you have huge income inequalities not only among people, but also among, um, among provinces so, and districts. So here in the north, much lower, right? 30% of our population, right? So on and so forth. This is where much of Thailand lives. The key point that I want to make for you who come from multinational corporations is there's nothing special about where I live. There's nothing special about northern Thailand. There is nothing special about Thailand, Thailand right? Three billion of the world's poor live in rural areas like my district, okay? So we are the bottom of the pyramid. And what I want to do today is to talk about what we want and what we need and what we do not need and what we do not want. Here's what we don't need. We don't need charitable donations, right? Corporations are always giving us nice stuff, computers. I can't tell you how many NGOs I have been to with piles of boxes of new hardware that, and they don't know how to use them. I mean, nobody could type let alone program a computer, let alone set up a network, you know. I mean, people give you all sorts of stuff. But that stuff is gone when it's gone, and then it's gone, okay? The problem is that none of it contributes to the ultimate ability of a community to sustain itself, okay? Other thing we don't want is we don't want stuff that you're doing for yourself. Right? I mean, people talk about CSR, and they talk about, oh, we put in a plant to recycle our gray water. You know, we replace all our inefficient light bulbs. And so, well, I'll tell you, these are great for the world as a whole. You know, and it makes, it makes me really happy to know that you all are contributing to saving the environment and so on. But they don't do diddly for us, okay? I'm just telling you, the bottom of the pyramid is not gaining in any measurable way from this. Yes, I mean, we're, we're the ones who are going to get hurt by global warming, but in the short term, forget it. We're not interested. They're, these are not social from our point of view. So what are we interested in? We want you to be investing in our community in ways that will provide sustained improvements in quality of life. But here's what we want. We want investment in innovation. We want you to think about how you can rethink your products how you can rethink your processes, how you can rethink your supply chains and so on in ways that will make profits for you and thereby make training opportunities in our community, job opportunities, open access to markets for us and so on. Why? Why do I really think this? First, if it's not profit driven, it will die in three years. Corporate projects never last more than three years. Foundation projects never last longer than three years. NGO projects never last longer than, right? There's always a flavor of the day. One, for three years it's water, for three years it's this, for three years it's that, and then everybody goes away, you know? I mean, it's bad enough that they never leave Chiang Mai to come and visit maybe once, 
right? I'll tell you a story, right? In my district, when I arrived, we did a, we did a market study of our district to see who was in microenterprise. We didn't find anybody in microenterprise. But we discovered there had been 17 microenterprise projects run in our district in the previous three years, okay? 17 for 17, they had failed. Now, statistically, that's hard to do, right? I mean, just by mistake, somebody should have succeeded. 17 for 17 failures, and every one of them had been reported as a success by the UN or nonprofit that had sponsored. Move, man, that's pretty interesting. But we don't, we're not interested in that kind of stuff. We want things that are profit-driven because they will keep you in the community. And second, we are interested in profit-driven programs because they produce social wealth, not just social value. And let me explain that to you because this is absolutely critical in your rethinking of CSR, okay? Social value are the nice things in life. They're like the icing on the cake, okay? They're like having electricity, having you know, healthcare, having medicine, having, right? That's the good stuff in life, right? But social wealth is the means by which you acquire that. That is the sustainable capacity of the community to make its own money, right? To engage in external markets in positive ways that the terms of trade in that exchange in some way or another is bringing wealth into the community. Wealth with which the community itself can then in turn buy its own social value. Okay? If all you do is give people the icing, you never give them the, 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 the main course, right? They're never going to get anywhere. Okay. So I want to talk about what you want, what we want, and about how CSR can actually make that. And you got to admit, okay? None of this, this touchy feely stuff. Oh, CSR isn't marketing. CSR. Forget it. Just give it up, okay? Think about CSR as part of your business strategy. And forget having CSR people do it. You should have your business development people deeply involved in CSR, okay? What you want is you want supply. You want to, you know, you want to increase your supplies. You want to improve your supply chain. You want to ensure future supply, right? Back to global warming. Global warming is going to fundamentally change Thailand. By 2050, this country's part, the most valuable parts of this country are going to be underwater. Places like where I live are going to be growing soybeans. And I will tell you, soybeans don't pay with rice pays, okay? You want to reduce costs. You want to increase demand. You want to both keep your current customers happy and thinking you're lovely and wonderful and green and yada, yada, yada. And you want to be building new customer bases and keeping them on board. And you've got to deal with governments, okay? So face up to the fact that as businesses, you have business needs that should be driving your CSR approach. What do we want? We want meaningful training, okay? The Thai school system, pardon my saying so, is among the worst in the world. Nobody learns anything useful. This applies for vocational training too. Thailand today, from its vocational school system, will produce less than half of the skilled trained you know, workers it needs. Less than half. And furthermore, the graduates it does produce can't do anything. Right? I mean, they, they are not trained in relationship to the jobs which they, no, there's no relationship between industry and vocational technical education. There's no companies coming in and setting up shops so that students learn on what they're going to actually be doing. Forget it. You know, you just totally random stuff. I mean, I had a discussion at the forum um, two weeks ago. Um, with a guy who's a, a big mocker in, in a big construction company that happens is their CSR stuff, one of the things they do is to, to build schools for the border police. And they use concrete. So he says, what we do is we invite graduates of vocational technical schools to come up and work with our people building these schools. And by the time they finish doing that, they know something about concrete. And at least they can get a real job instead of carrying concrete on their heads, okay? Right? We want quality jobs, too. I mean, you know, carrying, carrying concrete on your head does not constitute a good job. People want full-time jobs with benefits. We want access to markets. In my village, right, people sell ka kind of, the kind of ginger. They sell, you know, a bunch of stuff via a middleman 
There is no source of information about wholesale prices in the wholesale market in Qingdao. This is not rocket science. This somebody should be providing this. I keep thinking, oh, that's another thing I could do, among many sorts of things. But people don't have access to market. They don't have access to goods. I mean, they would really like to buy stuff, lots of stuff, but they can't get to it, right? And they want a better quality of life. I mean, 20 plus percent of our population live up on top of mountains. They don't have electricity, right? Because they don't have electricity, they don't have fans, they don't have refrigerators, they don't, they don't have anything, okay? So here's what we have. Well, we don't have any vocational technical training. We don't have any quality jobs. We're so far away from anywhere that there's bloody nothing that you can make there because every company we've tried to interest in coming says, yeah, man, if those transportation, forget it. I can't, it can't possibly produce there. I mean, there's a huge potential demand, and there's basic services. So if you think about maybe you want to get into these areas, you want to be innovative, there's lots of potential. So I think if companies really want to do meaningful CSR, and they're not going out and looking at crowds and saying, God, there are a lot of poor people here. Let's give them some school books. Let's give them some whatever, right? But think instead, man, there are a lot of people here who would buy a lot of stuff. If we could figure out a way to make a profit paying them to buy the stuff we wanted to buy from us, or whatever, right? So there are all kinds of things that you can do. And I can give you business ideas for all of these. Let me just talk to you through one. Pepsi. Anybody from Pepsi here? I sat next to Coke in, 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 at the forum, and so I had to be very polite about this and so on. But Pepsi has one of the best CSR programs I've ever seen. Pepsi's in the snack food business. Actually, Pepsi, the drink, is now no longer the main source of their income. They're basically in the Fritos and all that kind of stuff. What do you make Fritos? They make them out of corn, right? They have a huge demand for corn and rice. And they're looking out there at the world and they're saying, the world is changing. We've had 10 years of drought, which has destroyed wheat production. We've had 10 years of flooding in the American Midwest, plus the ethanol thing, which has killed sources of corn. What are they going to do? So what did they invest in? They thought, well, where is corn going to come from in the future? And as the whole process of global warming comes along, what's going to happen? Water is going to be the most important asset out there. We have to do something to secure our future. We need to be strategic. What did they do? They invented from scratch a huge corporate CSR program aimed at what? Teaching large numbers of very poor peasants in places that grow rice and corn how to do very low water agriculture and very low input agriculture, so on and so forth, right? Now, it transformed those people's lives, but it also gave Pepsi an absolutely secure head of their supply chain. And it prepared those people in ways that won't be possible when it finally comes to pass that those areas won't have enough water for traditional agriculture. Okay? So here was an investment, right, that was strategic, business driven. The, the actual ROI on this project is going to be huge, even if it was a CSR project, right? And what did the community get? Well, it got hugely meaningful training, right? It got quality jobs. It became profitable in important ways to be a farmer now. Because Pepsi, of course, came in and put, a, put in place a market structure put in place a pricing structure, set up secure markets you know, for, for these people and so on. It provided the market and, of course, risk mitigation, right? Now you have Pepsi providing the front end, providing the back end, setting you up so you weren't subject to, to droughts in the same way you were before. There was crop insurance in place. I and mean, this, this is what an agricultural community needs. Now, okay, I don't want to go, I want to go here. I, I want to talk about my other my other baby, um, uh, which is a, um, and, and just, this is simply because this is what I think you should be doing, and, and, and I'm going to use my own my own stuff as a, as an example, simply because I actually know it best. And, and here, this is a Second Harvest Power Company that we set up. It's Second Harvest is actually a holding company which is going to 
work with others to invest in single district operating companies. So district by district operating companies, our equity partners in the project are um, uh, uh, PEA, the Provincial Electricity Authority, um, and um, uh, an organization that's part of the Ministry of Energy that exists to try and um, get this stuff, this stuff going. But basically, you know, we're thinking about Thailand and asking ourselves, what is it about Thailand that makes it into a real market for alternative energies, right? And if you look at this, you know, I mean, Thailand is an ideal market for anybody who's interested in going into alternative or renewable energy. So if you're Thailand, if you're sitting down in Parliament or whatever, what, what is going to motivate you? Well, you've got this energy problem, you've got this poverty problem, and you've got this global warming problem. And all of them fit together into a package. And the Thais know it, right? I mean, here's a very simple statement. Now, acting on it, getting from policy conception to implementation is a whole other story, but there's a clear understanding of what is necessary for the future. So Thailand can go at its energy problem in two ways. It can go the old way, right? So if it's got 1,700 megawatts worth of biomass out there, it's actually a hugely larger number than that. But in terms of what was at the time the study was done, understood as, as biomass, they could fire two coal power systems. So currently sitting on the sitting on the books are two 750 um, megawatt coal power stations. Because of NIMBY, not in my backyard, neither of these power plants is moving right now, but they are on the they are on the books. This is what those plants will produce. Okay? The alternative of course, is 1,500 megawatts of small one megawatt of, of, of biomass power plants, right? You get exactly the same amount, but if you use private investors, it doesn't cost the country a dollar, a bot in uh, national uh, money, right? There's no investment in transmission because you can build these plants where the power is needed. Today, with hub and spoke system, all the power gets generated right here. By the time the power gets to Chiang Mai, PEA has suffered a 25% line loss. So Thailand is, is producing roughly 125% as much power as it actually is able to consume. That, I mean, that is an inefficiency of absolutely staggering proportions especially in a country that then subsidizes its costs in ways that promotes wasteful consumption and doesn't really do anything to promote development, okay? But the real beauty comes in, in here, right? These are tremendously expensive. This is really, really important. But here's where the real beauty is, right? Because if you put these biomass plants, these small biomass plants out in the countryside, all of this agricultural waste which is waste, it just gets burned in the field, now has to be processed and moved to the plant. You're creating jobs, you're valorizing a waste product and putting new money into people's pockets and so on. And if you set the company up right, and we'll, you know, our business plan calls for 10% of, of total process, profits to go into a development fund for the community, you can actually create a development fund in local communities which they control. So for the first time ever, these communities can actually undertake development as they define it. Not as Bangkok tells them it's going to be, and not as some big NGO with its own agenda comes in and tells them it's going to be, but they can say, this is what we want. And by God, we have $100,000 in our account right now, but we can go ahead and, and do it. But let's put Thailand in perspective, right? Thailand, and we were talking at lunch about, well, why not go to Cambodia, okay? Why not go anywhere else in the developing world, right? I mean, if Thailand offers this opportunity, look at what the rest of the developing world offers. And if you want to go further than that, think about all of the 5.4 billion people who are considered the bottom of the pyramid, right? Um, and think about what they confront, those 143 
countries of the developing world, right? I mean, every one of them faces the same problems as Thailand, right? The global strategic policy problems confronting Thailand are the same problems that are the drivers of national policy and all of these other, and they're not going away. I mean, if you come up with a business that is going to address these issues, you're, and you're smart, right? <laughs> the basic drivers of your business also aren't going to go away. So if you think about this as a company that's in the energy business, it's a dirty business, you're in steel, you belch out huge and unavoidable amounts of CO2, maybe you want to go into something like this, right? Because there's going to be a real good market for this stuff. This is going to be a profitable vehicle. You're going to make money on this on this deal, right? I mean, we're thinking about I, I, you know, in, internal rates of return on this in the order of 35 percent. Now, in Asia, you normally want to have a higher return than that if you're going to invest in an energy project, but it's not bad, right? And the great thing about it is that PEA is going to, by law, buy all 25 years, 100% of your energy production for the next 25 years before you build the plant. Well, that, that's an that's a uptake that I would love to have in those businesses, okay? And you can do good by doing well, or be well by doing good, all right? So the environmentalists, you want to sell this? The people who are kicking your brand all over the place and so on? Well, look at this. Right? I mean, this is something that's fixing problems, real meaningful problems in the world, right? And this is an environmental project that people want to be involved in, right? The people on the ground in particular, but all people all over the place, right? And finally, as a community development social change agent, your company has suddenly, you know, for one of these one megawatt plants, you're talking about creating 50 full-time benefited jobs for a community. You're talking about putting 4.5 million baht in new revenue into the community simply for the purchase of the fuel. That's not counting the salaries of these people and so on and so forth. You're talking about putting something in order of $50,000, $60,000 a year in profits into the, um, into the, depend, uh, the development fund and, 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 and so on. So you're really talking about um, something that's going to make um, a huge difference. So I mean, this is to, to see um, you know, what, what this looks like, and you can, you can check out the website. This is the website for our, um, our first, um, our first um, company. But um, you know, it's, it's, it displays the whole principle and so on. And you know, Thai farmers are really conservative. So, you, know, you had to really sell this, go out, and this is in English, but I'm telling you, I have spent more hours out sitting in communities, drinking huge quantities of, of whiskey, um, talking to people about why this is better for them in the current situation, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So let's go back to the other presentation and wrap up here. Um, so let's go to one. Uh, I think, yes, OK. So I mean, here's, the, here's the question we sort of start with. Can you do this, right? Can it be profitable? Do, do we actually want it? And absolutely yes, right? But you, the companies, have to think about profits. You have to think about doing things that are going to make you money because that's the only way you're going to come into our communities and stay, right? You have to be innovative, right? Just selling the same old stuff isn't going to work. The bottom of the pyramid, and by the way, that is a really offensive term. But but the bottom of the pyramid is probably not going to buy your standard, you know, your, 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 your standard product line, right? But there are an awful lot of us, right? And if you can rejigger your product, or you can think about ways of distributing the production of your product or whatever, there are a whole lot of us, right? And you can make a lot of money on it. You have to think long term. Think like Pepsi. Right? Don't think, what is the immediate return on this going to be, whatever your accountants are telling you. Think about what's the situation going to be 25 years from now. And how can we leverage this as a pilot project into something that becomes part 
of our strategic business plan as we go forward. Because I will tell you, the bottom of the pyramid is reproducing a lot faster than the top of the pyramid. So if you think 25 years out, I'm telling you, there are going to be a lot more of us to think about selling to. Okay? And with that, I will leave it. Let me introduce myself. My name is Jim Pelosuva from Bristol Myers Squiz. Um, thank you for your uh, interesting presentation. Um, I had a question about the Faro, uh, the, 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 the company's presentation where you have shown the investment of what it takes to do two coal plants, and then you said if you had uh, smaller uh, plants, you know, 1,500 of them, and you had written 000 investment. But I imagine there's some sort of cost associated with it, so just Oh, your on that. By, by zero, I meant to the Thai taxpayer, right? Because if, if EGAP, the, the national semi-governmental semi production company, is going to do this, it's going to be taxpayer money. It's going to fall on government and the government budget to do this. But if you're going to be using independent power producers to do it, it's going to be a private project. Uh, is this all? No? Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you, work. I'm only an engineer, you know. <laughs> I know. I never ask you to maintain anything in the house. <laughs> very interesting talk, and it fits exactly. I, I, I want to share very briefly with everybody, but I'd love to talk to you further about in more detail afterwards, perhaps. <clears throat> but I'm a, an engineer, I call myself Alternative Innovations, which fits your. Uh, category very well, conceptual design. Since a year ago on the flooding here in Thailand, I came up with a concept which, contrary to yours as individual uh, projects, is actually, I call it the National Flood Prevention System. Flood prevention and a national one. And for my concept, it must be controlled by government. But it could be linking into exactly what you're doing. So very briefly, if I may just outline it, because it's quite, quite detailed. It requires building many water uh, uh, retention reservoirs, not dams, like the old mill pond system, off-taking so we're not disturbing the river. Instead of having a water wheel, you have a water turbine, which can <coughs> do all the things that you're talking about. You can either it'll generate electricity for one thing, and you can recycle the water as well, mm -hmm. or you can pump the water back up and recycle it for your second crop. Um, and the excess power you can put into the grid. <coughs> Given this will be happening in all these small tributaries in the tributary system and bigger ones, <coughs> you then have power exactly where it's falling off the end in your description of how it works. So these will be providing uh, construction projects within every small community. So it's doing all the things that you were saying and instead of having a flood uh, water control system like they're doing, you're actually doing flood prevention, so you're protecting the whole country from flooding and all the industry, and you're, you're not having to buy the gas from Burma or the gas from uh, Malaysia, and those numbers you've got in megawatts, you've got thousands of megawatts coming into the system, self financing And I'd love to talk with you further on it. I just okay. wanted to let everybody get an idea of what it is. And I am talking to the Minister of Science and Technology, the Minister of Finance here. I've spoken to the Minister of uh, Energy in Nepal. I've spoken to the Minister of Agriculture. Yeah, no, that's the way you've got to do it, right? I know, I know. <laughs> and the Minister of Agriculture and Forest in Bhutan. And they're all, and I've got, I'm plugging into Sri Lanka as well at the moment. Anyway, it'd be great to talk to you. I'd, I'd love to talk to you. Thank you very much. You want to <coughs> I want to thank you for the presentation. My name is Søren. I'm from a company called Asian Races. And uh, basically, it's not a question, but it's uh, like a comment <coughs> to your presentation because uh, basically our company is doing, our business plan is exactly like your presentation. Uh, <coughs> and uh, I'm very, very happy to hear that you emphasize this 
they have to be, be profit driven. But uh, in our business, it's uh, a problem towards many NGO organizations. So they actually <laughs> turn, they turn us down when we admittingly uh, uh, confess to be a private corporate enterprise. And uh, here's the question to be from me to you: Is what are you doing to uh, to emphasize that the profit-driven CSR is actually much much more valuable than this just posting useless money in what could have been use, <coughs> useful projects, but they drown themselves because well, <coughs> one of the big problems I see in the way, and I think we agree very much, is that they sell out specialists. They are not educating people. The specialists need, again, and they need <coughs> people with an empty hand. But uh, how do you approach this, uh, the private enterprise? Well, you, you've just injected yourself into a conversation that maybe I, I just wrote an article have, about that. have been about having. That You'll probably want to have a conversation with her. But look, I'm very much a maverick on all of this. I mean, traditional NGOs don't want to hear this, and they don't want to do business with you. And I think part of it is, is sort of the NGO ethic, or the current ethic. And part of it is that you have to understand that the money that is traditionally given goes to the NGO and is then distributed out. So you are part of their revenue base, right? Or the, the traditional CSR operation is part of the NGO's revenue base. So they take off the top 10 or 15 percent. That helps them, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so in part, there is the way in which NGOs have traditionally done business. And then that's a, there's an important justification associated with that, which is we don't do business, right? We don't sully our hands with that. Because, and here's the argument, when you do business the way you are, for example, getting Hill Tribe women to read beautiful things, you are by definition being exploitative because, you know, cheap Marxism, all profit comes at the cost of um, you know, the, the, the women involved, right? Um, and so, so there's, there's a whole line of logic there that um, is never brought to the surface, never examined, and, and so on and so forth. And I think the only thing that you can do around that is to be absolutely transparent about how you're doing business. Now, we run a large microenterprise program where we train people how to grow silk, how to spin silk, how to organically dye silk, um, and how to weave beautiful things. And in principle, every one of those steps could be highly exploitative. I mean, if we wanted to really push people who have no other alternatives, we could drive down what we pay for all of those inputs, because we are the ultimate buyer of the, of the silk scarves because we are the only people with access to the European and American market. So how does this work? Well, in the end, it's simply because, you know, we're actually honest. We buy for what is a fair wage price for the production of the product in Prow. We then sell it overseas, getting the profit bump that you get from going from the bottom of the pyramid to the top of the pyramid and we split the net profit 50-50 with our producers. So the money is dividended back to the cooperatives um, at the end of the day. So that people can understand that whole process. And you know, if you don't like our process, then you don't like our microenterprise program. But as you said, you know, there is expertise that is needed. And the reason, in fact, that all of these microenterprise projects fail is that the people setting them up didn't know anything about business, had never run businesses and so on, and they understood the value chain as having a single choke point on it. You know? And if we teach these women X or Y, then they're going to go into business. And my favorite case is the cooperative that is our, our sewing cooperative, right? So a, a group came there, I will not name the NGO, they are internationally reputed, right? But they came in and said to this woman, what would you like to, to learn how to do? And the woman said, we'd really like to learn how to sew. 
And so the engineers say, what do you want to learn how to sew? And the woman said, well, everybody needs hats. We'll sew hats. And so the NGO brought in um, material and sewing machines and taught the women how to sew and taught them how to sew hats. And the women sewed 4,000 hats. This was the year before we came to town. Five years later, they still have 4,000 hats minus the hats they wear. Now, what was the problem here? Well, the problem is that almost none of the women in the, in, in the co-op had ever been to Chiang Mai, which is only 90 kilometers down the road. Right? So, on the one hand, they didn't have any concept of demand for a product understood as, why would my hat be the hat that somebody would spend disposable income on as opposed to another hat? What's going to make give my hat, if you will, defensible comparative advantage in a marketplace swamped by cheap hats produced in China? Right? I mean, that's a, that's a big question in Chiang Mai, because I'll tell you, 99% of the stuff for sale in Chiang Mai comes from China. And they're not a, a prayer people are going to be able to compete with, okay? But then there was the problem of now how do you get to market? And how do you find a retail outlet for it? Or how do you find even a wholesale outlet for it? And how do you find a wholesale outlet for it at a price which makes any sense at all? Even if this is donated cloth and donated thread and you can, you know, you can dump the first 4,000 on the market, how are you going to make enough money in that sale to purchase enough cloth and thread for the next round of 4,000 packs, right? So it's this failure to understand business as a complicated business and understand that there is truly value added in that process. Business is not all about exploitation. There is a tremendous amount of value added at every step along the value chain. And that if you want people in places like where we live to be able to join into the market in a way that their products can be sold in that outside market in, a pot, in, sort of in a sense in positive terms of trade so that there will be profits coming back into the community and community social wealth will increase, they're going to need a lot of help. If you're an NGO and you say, well, we, we don't do business, well, you're not going to provide any help. Sir, can I help you with that answer? Um, I think you need to be disruptive within the marketplace. And to do that, there is a growing generation of social entrepreneurs who understand social responsibility and entrepreneurship. All you have to do is bring in one or two and disrupt the whole system. And you will find that disruption will create change. If you wait for change to happen, it will take a very long time. To disrupt it shortens that process. And to disrupt that isn't such a that's easier to do than trying to get NGOs and nonprofits to change. And just, if, just a final comment is uh, we have actually been in operation for 18 years in a place called Lishu Lodge in uh, Chiang Mai where we are grown from one house with six rooms until we have uh, 24 now. We won't have mass tourism, we are a tourism company, but we won't have mass tourism while we stop at 24 uh, four rooms. Uh, the surrounding community has grown from 16 households to more than 300 now. Uh, we have, uh, the measure says that uh, our local village is uh, producing about 70% of all the heat tribe stuff sold on the, the night market in, uh, in Chiang Mai as well. So we are actually <coughs> in very well founded, we are part of a very big company here in Thailand, but we are the social arm of that. Mm -hmm. So we are so always, have, because we have been operating model with, at work. <coughs> in red numbers basically from the beginning but we get supported from the big corporation uh, <clears throat> but of course we are interested in developing this and also uh, taking this this thing away that everything because you're private that uh, then it can be good it and uh, it's what I'm happy to hear it's actually that it can be better when it's uh, 
when it's done for a profit because also the local communities like you <coughs> you talked about this allocation we have set up bridge banks all the places that we are operating where we just join as oper uh, observers while <coughs> the local people decide 100 percent what what they're going to spend the money let me on. just say, say one thing here that I, that I do want to say and, and it goes directly to this point that you've just made that you are on the ground working in these villages that there's a lot of local control over the projects and so on i went to the forum the asian forum on corporate social responsibility there were 600 people there i was the sole person representing a an ngo that wasn't an ngo that monitored csr so I was the sole representative of the bottom of the pyramid, and I was there quite by accident. I mean, I was there because an ex-student of mine works at a French um, business school and had just written a case about our microenterprise program. And so it was just this sort of totally accidental sort of thing. One of the things that really struck me about that whole forum, who out of the observation that I was the only representative of the, of, of the base of the pyramid, Everybody at the forum talked about the base of the pyramid. Nobody at the forum had ever met the base of the pyramid. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, if you researched your for sale products as badly as you re researched the bottom of the pyramid, you would all be out of business, right? I mean, you are looking at a 5.4 billion person market, and you guys, the CSR people are supposed to be the front line of penetration of that market, and you've never been there. You don't invite them to talk. You talk about them as this global other, to use some <laughs> modernist speak, you know. But I found it just extraordinary that nobody actually goes out and sits down and drinks with people. You know, and I'll tell you, anywhere, I've worked all over. I've worked all over Africa, I've worked all over Asia, you know, and drinking's real important. And you gotta drink whatever they drink. I mean, here, you know, if you don't drink well, how, I'm just telling you, you're nobody, okay? The first thing you gotta do is sit down and you gotta drink two or three bottles. I kid you not, two or three bottles of Lao Chao with the head with it. And after you've done that, you've, you've got your stripes, you know? And they'll say, oh. they'll sit there talking to you. What's the story with this falan? Oh, no problem, King Lao Chao. King Lao, oh, King Lao, oh, you know? And, okay, you're cool. But you gotta, you know, you gotta, you gotta walk the walk. And you gotta talk the talk. You gotta get down to the bottom. Because as long as you think they're, they're out there, you know, as long as you behave like those big NGOs that all have really nice apartments in Chiang Mai and really big cars, you know, have huge SUVs, really big mud tires on them and so on. And they drive around Chiang Mai, you know? And their idea of going on a project trip is to drive 30 kilometers out of town. You know, they, they put on incredible safari suits, really big boots and stuff like that, you know? People like me and all the people who work for me, you know, we're asking them on our foot clock, you know? Like, hey, we should make this more exciting, you know? So anyway, you, you were, I, I don't know, it's just a second again. You wanted to say something. Hello. I'm uh, Rachel. I'm an NGO consultant. Oh, I'm even better. <laughs> you don't be grandpa. Right? 15 years, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm global. I, I'm, I'm a global observer of the phenomenon of the bottom of the pyramid. And 15 years in um, blood, sweat, and tears in fundraising, advertising, and communications for low and high level NGOs. But anyway, um, I have a couple of questions uh, one relating to the warm part, one relating to se Second Harvest, which I think is incorporated in the warm part. And no. Oh, it's not? No. Okay. Uh, okay. So for a reason separate. of Thai law, I mean, they, they couldn't get their head around the idea of a for profit operation that. Uh -huh. They extended the mission of the foundation and paid into the foundation funds that could not be taken out of the foundation but only used on foundation projects. So, oh, I see. Say, so it's not like in the, in the States where an no, NGO could yeah, have you, you, not In the States, so yeah, it'd be no problem. But right. here it proved to yeah. be beyond the reach of the law. Okay, that makes, that makes sense. Then. 
Well, then I have three different questions. And the first is, given the relative isolation of the members of the community where Warm Heart and Second Harvest are, are operating, what is beyond the silk, the, the, the silk trade? <laughs> Uh, what is the, the major livelihood of the people there currently? And then the other two questions are um, are basically the same uh, between Warm Heart and Second Harvest. Did, did you and your, your team do mappings and collaborations with other NGOs of similar um, outlook or, and or social enterprises, energy groups like on the Bob and Laos, for example, like looking at best practices or um, uh, how, how to operate such endeavors in Southeast Asia? Yeah. Um, first question, what do people do? Um, about a third of the population has no land at all. So they are dedicated agricultural day laborers. Um, while there is work, which is about seven months a year, the average rate of pay is about 125 a day. Um, the next third of the population, and in fact it's probably rather more than that, owns too little land to, to be able to live on. So they are always engaged in agricultural day labor in addition to um, farming their own plots. Um, Lowland uh, prow is divided essentially in, in, in half. Roughly 20% of the population, we don't know for certain because there's so many stateless and unregistered people, but let's say roughly 20% of the population are hill tribe, um, and about 80% of the population are lowland Thai living in the, in the Fertile Valley. In the valley, we grow um, rice as the primary cash crop, um, corn, um, some of which goes with cash crop and some of which is um, for, for local consumption, mango and langa, longan, um, which is a variant of minchi or whatever. Um, and that is sold almost exclusively to China, although the highest grades are sold for consumption here. Um, so those, those four crops are the primary cash crops. Um, and um, because um, Everything but rice. I mean, rice, everybody says, well, you're engaging in the world market, you know, you get screwed. Well, I'll tell you, proud, if you own land, rice land and proud, you've made a lot of money in the last decade because the effect of uh, failures of wheat crops and, and corn crops has led to historically very high prices of rice. And you've seen a, a real accumulation of, of wealth on the part of landholders in, in proud. We're also hitting the end of a generation. And so um, small farmers in their late 40s and early 50s, which you know, we are as whole, um, have children who don't want to take over the farm. So they're selling that. So we're seeing a, a very rapid concentration of land in the hands of very few people, and therefore um, a transition of the population base, the resident population basically to day labor. So the, they, those are the key cash crops. Um, but the production of it is becoming very, very much more concentrated. The wealth that comes out of them very much more concentrated. And the primary source of income is, is there. Either. In the mountains, um, there is some dry rice um, uh, grown almost entirely for village consumption. Um, and then corn is the primary cash crop. Um, yields in the mountains are extremely low. Um, it's common to see fields planted with one plant per meter so that a rye can yield as little as a 500 baht um, profit per rye. So hill tribe families just make nothing out of their, out of their, of their, their crops and basically must leave the villages in order to find work outside to be able to earn the income necessary to, to support themselves. Um, your second question was, you know, what research should we do, you know, before forming one heart and before forming second harvest? No, the story of one heart um, uh, is that I was running a an end trafficking program in Mesai on the uh, Thai uh, Burmese border in 2007, and most of the people I was working with were young women who'd been who'd been trafficked, um, and uh, they. They, they spent huge amounts of time talking with me and fundamentally changed my understanding of trafficking. 
they basically said, just forget all the crap you've been told, and including the crap that the organization we were working with put out, and basically said, look, Ajahn Chaitanya, which is what they call me, you know, you, you have to understand poverty. You have to understand what it means to live where being poor is much better than any other alternative. And, you know, they, they said, look, these people you call traffickers, they were free ride for us to, to work. We didn't have to pay the bus. Um, and this was girls from southern China, girls from Burma, girls from Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and Hill Tribe girls from Northern Thailand. And um, they basically said, you have to, you have to start a, uh, an NGO that is going to do what he's doing, which is to raise the economic floor for families so that, so that this just doesn't have to happen anymore. And that was the motivation. There were two, the young Thai guy and his now American girlfriend uh, in that area, and I all working there. And we said, OK, basically, we'll do it. And my wife flew through on a business trip. The four of us shook hands, and 11 months later, we opened the you know, world. And um, you know, we came in with all sorts of plans. You know, and dumped all of it when we began interviewing in the community. Um, we have uh, deliberately not pursued um, an initial policy of scalability and replicability because upon doing a lot of interviewing in the community, I mean, we basically spent our first six months doing nothing but interviewing headmen, headmen's councils, you know, individuals and so on, everywhere. And it was very clear that what we had thought was needed and what they thought was needed were fundamentally different. And that none of the models that we showed up with, you know, NGOs that do this or that, none of that made any sense anymore. And so we basically started from nothing. We, we, we started trying to figure out how to deliver what they wanted and have now, I think, after four and a half years, begun to get to the point where we think we have ways to package some of those ideas that we may be able to, to put out. Um, and we have now partners in communities who can go you know, to the next district over or whatever and, and basically be the ones who talk and sell the program and, and, and do it. Um, but no, I mean, we haven't, and I will tell you that, that subsequently in you know, my experience with the NGOs and all is that they, they all have a plan, and the plan doesn't necessarily, in fact, it almost never really makes sense in terms, it comes with a definition of you know, underdevelopment, a definition of poverty, and so on, which the people we live with simply don't recognize, they don't understand, you know. Um, if you arrive with a notion that you, if you say, I know poverty when I see it, then we all know poverty when we see it, right? You take that into every one of our villages, you know, people, just, they, don't, they don't recognize themselves in the definition. I mean, I live, in a, I live in a village of you know, 175 people, and they don't see themselves as poor. They don't see themselves in need of help. They, you know, it's like, we're really happy people, we a really good time. You know, it takes a lot of work to get to the point where we know we're talking about things where when you can begin to define specific issues that they want to address, you know. And, and they don't see them as overwhelming problems. You know, they say, you know, things could be different. You know, you know, you know, it takes, I mean, part of this is just kind of, you know, but this is, in my experience, almost any poor community. You know, this is as much the case when I work in America as it is you know, here. Um, so I've become very weary of organizations that, you know, in a sense, have their program in their name and are set up for replicability, are set up for scale, get $50 million from aid to do umpty ump versions of exactly the same thing. But it's like, you know. And along with that, and this goes to something that, that Adriana has, has talked about, this notion of disruption. How do you measure what you're doing at that scale? You, know, you can say, uh, you know, we're USA. We can't afford to be time on the ground. We have to get to large-scale projects. We have to do a thousand of something. Well, that's fine. Okay. So, what do you use as your evaluative criteria? Well, we spend our budget on time. We did the projects, right? 
What happened afterwards is in our business. It was out of the budget site. We don't go back five years later and see whether it's still working. It's not, it's not on the budget site. Right? So we can be a success just by doing the project. Right? Um, the problem is that you know, when you go back five years later, there's nothing there. And so you can do you know, a $50 million project a lot of times and have $50 million worth of failures. And you can spend a lot of time on the ground and figure out what actually works. And then do it really slowly. <laughs> you know? I mean, the scale thing really, really, really bothers me a lot. Because if you can't scale, you can't play. You know? But in the end, how, where you start with scale makes a huge difference. I mean, I spent a lot of time as a social scientist and you know, work in an area where you know, it's a Marxist dependency, all these people talk about social forces. There's always just a gag. You know? I'm interested in the micro foundations of social media. Why does this guy, what motivates this one person to do what he does and this guy and this guy to come together in ways that solve collective action problems and cause big results to happen. And here too, I want to do the same thing. You know, I want to be in a village and I want to know why these people do what they do and come together to accomplish what they accomplish. And until I understand those micro foundations, I'm never going to say, I understand the causal path that leads to X, Y, and Z. You know, it's just, it's bad social science. Well, do, do you, oh. I think there's a professor of social science at what with Gertzel. I don't know. I'll, I'll ask you after this. I think you touched on a couple of points that I would be interested to hear more about um, in your last answer. One is, can you help us to understand, based on all the surveying you did, what is it that you learned that these folks say that they want, you know, that they need, and more, you know, I mean, you mentioned a lot, you talked about how businesses should focus on, you know, working on their products to cater to this group of large consumers. Obviously, you know, the challenge for businesses are, you know, those consumers have very little disposable income. So to sell them anything, it is, you know, a challenge, right? So, I mean, other than the necessities of food, which I think they're probably sourcing locally from where they can, right? Which is their number one priority, and shelter, which you show pictures, and I think, you know, like, what is it that they feel they want help with, that they need, you know, where you think we should try to focus? Okay, those are two really, really good questions. I mean, as for the first one, I think, it's fair to say that all of the results that we, we um, got come down to, boil down to essentially one observation. Our, our villages, our communities are failing, right? People are moving out, right? There's nothing to do here. You have to leave to make a living. I don't want my children to be a poor rice farmer because there's no future. I don't want my kid to have to chop corn on this mountain, right? So in the end, what the first thing that came up was how do we save our community? What can we do so that either the children leaving here to go to the big cities or wherever can have a better life there, right? We don't want them to go and be laughed at, right? I mean, we watch Thai TV, right? Who's the fall guy in all the, all the humor shows? The Nacho guy, you know, always, he's the stupid guy, right? Um, they don't want to be laughed at. They don't want their kids to be prostitutes. They don't want them. They drop out of school in sixth grade, you know? There's no, I mean, in America, we've got ESL. English is a second language. I mean, this is, you know, pretty fun. But there's no Thai as a second language. Program. These kids come down off the mountain at age seven, they go into school, they don't speak any Thai, and they just get overwhelmed. It takes them three years to learn enough Thai to really be functional. And by that point, they're so far behind that they hate school. They've been made fun of. It's just, you know, so, 
So they drop out of school. They don't have the education. They don't have any skills. They have no capacity to go out and function. And by the way, this doesn't just apply to the young trouble kids. I mean, if you look at the Thai educational system, on the national examinations, there is a five-point difference between the average grades of students who live in Bangkok and all the students in the rest of the country. Right? Kids who live in Bangkok are not smarter than kids who live in the rest of the country. It's just that there is such a gross maldistribution of resources that the schools are that much better. Okay? Now, when you live out at the tail end of everything, like all of the rural districts, Right? And just think about this country. If you, put a, if you take a compass and you put the point in Bangkok and you draw a circle, right? what do you do? You go up through Isan, you come across the north, you go over to Burma for a little while, and then you come down through the south. Right? What is the Thai hinterland? Where do, the pe where do poor people live? Right? Where is much of the population live? Isan, the most populous, the north, the second most populous. Where all they live? Hell and gone out in the middle of nowhere. In our school system, there is not a single specialty teacher who is trained as a science teacher, a math teacher, a Thai teacher. We don't have any Thai teachers. We have people teaching Thai math and science, but they were trained as, you know, banana leaf folders. I don't know. I, it, it's, it's like, you know, we have, we have schools with 800 kids and 20 computers, and most of them don't work. We have 54,000 people in our district. We have the same broad-based age population, right? There are 500 kids in high school. What does that tell you about the dropout rate, right? Okay. So people want education and skill training for their children because they don't want their children to live like them. The second thing that goes along with you this, recognize that education is normally not the purview of the private sector. I don't Especially just, education just, of the grades that you're talking about. Wait, 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 I've heard you talk for an hour now. I'm looking for something okay. actual for a corporation. Wait, wait, wait. You haven't given me anything yet. We can come back to that. We can come back to that. Okay? Second thing they want is they want real jobs in their communities that will give people jobs there so that they will have to go. Okay? So you want to talk about what needs and what, what, what we need. We need to have not investment necessarily in KZ six or whatever. But we could really use one, a vocational technical school, directly tied to industries. Okay? So none of this government stuff. But companies have an ongoing shortage of workers capable of doing the skilled labor that they need. Running numerically controlled cutting machines. I mean, just you think about what the industry in central Thailand actually needs by way of workforce. And you think about the fact that the Thai government response to the lack of those people is to say, well, MNC should set up their own universities to train Thai graduates to do the work that they actually need done. Well, okay, if you're going to start your own university, why don't you come someplace like Crown? which desperately needs that sort of training and is a hell of a lot less expensive than doing this in Bangkok, okay? So if we had two or three companies which know they are going to have demand for specific types of, of employees, why not equip out a VOTEC? Why not send a couple of your line managers out to actually do the training? That's just one possibility. But if you want to, if you think about cost reductions, Think about the reducing the cost of having getting the labor that you actually need in the front door. Set up your own training program. Set it up in a place where you will have an infinite supply of people coming in because of the huge demand. You can sort them however you want, and they will come feed into you. Okay. Second possibility: you're in the hotel industry. The hotel industry complains constantly that it can't get capable staff. And if any of you, I mean, you go to any major Thai hotel, and, and this goes for Marriott, for example, right? The waiters and waitresses are competent, but never capable of completely anticipating Western needs, right? There's always, the, the, the quality is just not there, okay? I hear this from Marriott executives, I hear this from, you know, everybody complains about this. 
To which you, and, and they say, well, we have to do all this, we do this in-house training. You know, it takes three months to train a maid. And you know, she's shadowing people, and we're paying her full wages, and you know, it clutters up the system. Well, okay, fine. Why don't you make your training program profitable? Why don't you go to a place like Proud, which is gorgeous? Why don't you set up a set of small eco lodges in places like Proud? Why don't you use them as your training station? So now you're being environmentally cool. You're doing your training on site. You have a set guest stream. You can now invite your guests to go to a place which is beautiful, eco, yada, 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 and feel good because they're participating in your corporate social responsibility program and being part of training these young people to be able to get well-paid, benefit-bearing jobs. So now you're paying for your whole training course. You can offload onto a profit-paying um, profit-making business, right? Which makes you look fantastic, right? So you've got little gardens, you know, you've got local people growing all your organic, whatever. I mean, you know, this doesn't take a lot of imagination to, to imagine this, but, but, you know, you've now taken, through CSR, you've taken a large cost out of your, out of your normal expenses, and you've turned it into a profit center, okay? So, you know, and I, you know, I can, I can invent this stuff ad nauseum, but I mean, I think that, that there are. If you think about, well, okay, we need people for our business. We need this for our business. We need that for our business. Okay, another one. You said, okay, well, there's, there's not much of our product that people can buy. There's no discretionary income. Wrong. There's a lot of money out there. It's tapping that money that's the problem, okay? There's a large demand, for example, for consumer durables. There are a lot of people out there who would like to washing machines, refrigerators, and so on. What is lacking is the capacity to finance those products. Okay? So companies that want to get out there need to set up the capacity to finance the purchase of their own products. Second, there's a large number of people in northern and northeastern China who don't have electricity. So you want to get to them. Okay, find a way to get them electricity and they will buy your products. Okay? Can they afford electricity? Yeah. Donnie claims to be 98% electrified. Are you talking about the 2% that's not electrified? God. Two. One, I don't believe the number. Okay? But two, if you, if you talk you about... You mentioned that there was no subsidy there. You realize that the taxpayer should put zero on the taxpayer's dollar. Don't forget the adder fee. Right. Oh, no, no. I mean, electricity. But they, Thailand's going to produce Compared coal, which requires no fuel subsidy to biomass. Right. But if you look okay. at a cost of generation perspective, right? Okay. It's right. a kilowatt hour. Okay. So more biomass and it comes through the subsidy. Right. right. Okay. So, 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 so to the I was in Myanmar two weeks ago, right? Yeah. I went to a, a renewable energy forum sponsored by ADB there, and I saw the Myanmar government present very eye-opening figures, and I saw a lot of people who lived. In, in the port, in the 68,000 villages in Myanmar, of which only 3,000 are electrified, right? Mm -hmm. And the government folks, there's an incredible method to their madness over there, what they have tried, right? The problem is, a village of 100 to 300 people only has an average consumption demand of 25 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. So if you put a megawatt gas fired power plant out there... No, I'm not talking about one megawatt. So, I'm talking so about... what. A but, unit you know, size. Can they, can they, they subsidize? Okay. I, I here's, the here's, here's the point. No, your solution. I no, 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 see, they, they don't. You know, that works in Myanmar, maybe, except you have the transmission and distribution cost. Like, show me the grid map. Show me the map of water or of hydro resources in Thailand. If it was here, they would do it themselves. Thailand doesn't have the hydro resources you're talking about. Your idea, I would be curious to see if it would ever materialize because. Building little, you know, microcosms of water retention places and then putting water turbines there, it's not going to work here. It doesn't work in Myanmar where they have 70, no, they have 40 something gigawatts of hydro resources available. Thailand doesn't have anywhere near that, which is why they look at importing it, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, but you do a megawatt, right, but you do a megawatt for a district, right, of 54,000 people, right? You're not going to do that in a village. I need to trade Okay, you don't have to trade them. You put a small generator in the village itself. Your CSR project is to enable your own customers. Okay, the cost of putting that outfit out there 
is much less than the long term the long the long term stream of products that you would sell out to me, right? So part of I mean, as you as you're thinking about where's my investment going to go, how am I going to use my investment, maybe part of it is enabling a whole new market, right? So you may want to put, you know, a tiny unit in villages of three hundred. And you might want to connect them together. Yeah? No. We use solar cells, we have distributed solar cells to the entire vintage mm -hmm. up there. And, and uh, we want like TV sets, whatever, but we still have those, uh, what are they, AT, uh, Yeah, we run into all sorts so, of troubles. So with. they're just charging the uh, normal uh, battery. car battery for yes. the whole day. And yeah, they can watch the TV until they and they do that in Myanmar as well. And they do that in Myanmar, but mm -hmm. the problem is like for the challenge, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be a wet blanket. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands the facts, right? Because I don't feel like they were adequately and accurately represented. Mm -hmm. Solar, first of all, has a capacity factor of sub 10 percent, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking four to six hours a day if you're lucky. Uh, awesome. So the cost of generation for solar is over 25 cents a kilowatt hour. In Myanmar's poor villages, and I don't know what it's like here, how much they, they can afford to pay, but it's heavily subsidized by the government. They pay between three and seven cents per kilowatt hour, right? There's no return that an investor can make there. If the consumer base is poor enough that they can only pay three to seven cents, but your cost of generation is 25, or by the way, rice husk gasification is over 15 cents a kilowatt hour to generate. So these folks can only pay even Thailand Bangkok market rates of nine to 10 cents. They'll never, they'll never pay that. There's no 35% IRR for an investor. Right? So one has to look at the solution in a way that makes sense for everybody, right? And, and believe me, we, I mean, I am the greenest, most uh, CSR-minded social entrepreneur person in GE, and I have tried my damnedest to find ways to work on this, right, through GE, and using GE's money, right? And I still want to do that, but it has to be viable, right? It has to make sense. But and the point is that in Thailand, you have a regulatory environment which has additive, right? That's the reality of it, and it's not going to go away. So, when you I mean, you're the, 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 to reduce the, those and all that stuff. But, right? but they're not going to go away, and even within any of the expected models of reduction in biomass additives, it's still going to make money. But the point I'm making about, about building your customer base is that your investment of CSR is providing the enabling tool. The, the, what you need to do to enable that market, right, is to provide them with electricity. And one can think of a whole series of other similar sort of, sort of market enabling initiatives, right? These people will not do this because there is some barrier. We can remove that barrier and their market behavior thereafter will provide us with the revenues that will cover the cost and then some of the investment we made in this market and made one um, CSR donation, right? So we get the good PR for putting this clean energy and giving these people electricity, yada, yada, yada. But we also get to sell them TVs, refrigerators, whatever, whatever, and you know we get the customer loyalty looking into the future. So my point is that, that you know this is necessarily going to save all of the world, it's a way to think about doing CSR that does not involve simply donating stuff to people, but actually is a way of giving them the capacity to do what they want, which is to have those consumer durables, go back to your original point, which makes life in the village good enough that some of the people who've moved to the city may now come back. Because lack of electricity is the single most commonly noted reason for not wanting to live up in the village. People say, you know, it's like, look, life is hard in the village. And, and if there was some way to make money in the village and there was electricity, and then they go on and say, and if there was a nurse, right? Um, the list of things is very short, right? But if the community doesn't have a capacity to make electricity, provide basic health care, and at least in some instances, provide their own school through through sixth grade, people aren't going to move back. So you asked me at the beginning, what is it that these people want? 
right? Well, here is a practical thing that a profit-oriented CSR strategy that is aimed at enabling buyers, right, can, can make a huge impact on these communities by solving what they see as one of their biggest problems. Okay? So, I'm not sure how I get to when you told me the 25% IRR. I was curious, is your, um, is your energy project a project in progress? Is it capitalized? We're, we're, we're fully capitalized at this point. I mean, we're waiting for the signature. I mean, the money's in the bag. We're waiting for the signature. At this yeah, I mean, we just can't. I mean, because of the the, the, the hole on everything, and so the added prices are set. And they, they won't sell about this, uh, the power plant project. I don't have this uh, similar pressure to get the IR up. Uh, well, one of the keys is 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 fuel costs. Yeah. I mean, if you look at. Yeah. And the solar thing that we uh, talk about. Uh, 
Yeah. 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 Was not sustainable. No. After just uh, maybe a year, two years, in the factory, you know, they have to charge the factory to make it uh, work now. And no maintenance and no good, let's say, thinking behind it. So most of those sort of things already gone. But you said the project, uh, after two, three years, five years, gone. So there's been the uh, villages have. Uh, which have got electricity, in spite of the fact that Thailand claimed that it has 98% electrified. Yeah. So, and, 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 and you can see that the whole Thailand is uh, uh, almost electrified. If you're coming in uh, to, 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 to Thailand, to Bangkok at night, you can see the waterline. <laughs> so very clear where, where, where is Thailand. But there's been uh, 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 many villages uh, who have got no, no electricity. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, because of the shortness of the world, shortness of the good living, so many, many people have to send their kids uh, to go somewhere to get back the education. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, the problem, I don't know, we are talking about uh, how to help them. Uh, one thing that I, 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 I always uh, have in mind is that with the burden I mean, probably we have in the country, in particular with the corruption, I don't know, so you, you from, 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 from outside Thailand, we see Thailand get uh, uh, lots of money that yeah. You see, I mean, from where I sit, I think it's fair to say that a great deal of what we do is stuff that is both legislated by the Thai government as to be done, it's regulated to be done, and in many cases there is a budget for it to be done, but it's not being done because the money gets lost somewhere along the trail. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves almost every day is, should we take, engage ourselves in doing something that the government knows is a problem, has been paid for, but the money is being stolen along the way. I mean, should we pick up the slack caused by corruption? And our answer to that in, in critical cases, um, care for the disabled, for example, has been, yeah, I mean, it's not fair to balance the burden of corruption on the backs of people who've had strokes. Um, but I think the problem is that there are relatively few assets out there to do this. So far, it's been the NGO sector that's supposed to be doing this, but it doesn't do it very well. And so my incentive in, in making this talk you know, is, in a sense, to reach out to the business community, which is really, I mean, the business community has the money. I mean, the bottom line is NGOs have to beg money. They beg it for businesses. And if businesses have a CSR program, what we'd like to see is them being creative about how to spend it in ways that meet the major problems that we confront, you know, training, or jobs, or market access, and so on. And you know, as as you say, I mean, the question is, how do you do that? You know, and, and how do you, I mean? It is really what what makes business sense? And I think it's not a question that I can necessarily answer. I mean, you know, I'm an ex-professor who's running an NGO, right? Okay, so I'm not necessarily the guy you want to ask that question to. But there are a lot of really smart business developers out there in the corporation that do business here that aren't involved in the CSR business. I mean, the, CR, the problem is that CSR isn't part of you know, it's not part of the main line to the top, right? It's kind of off on the side, right? And 
there's a whole philanthropy ethic about it, you know, and if you go up to headquarters in New York or in London or whatever, right, the, the big people, they have an advisory committee, you know, but they're friends of the, of the com corporate board, and they're also on the board of the local Philharmonic or whatever, you know, so there's this kind of philanthropic giving to orchestras, whatever, mentality, and it, it goes down through the organization, and I don't think these people are thinking about things this way. And you know, what's really necessary is for corporations to say, okay, CSR is about business. You know, it's about, well, we admit it. You know, we're going to organize some portion of our doing business in a way that there are social values and social you know, capital that come out of it. That's all you have to say. You don't have to apologize for that. But then you turn it over to the business developers and they look at it. And you know, they're really smart people. And I can tell you, they'll come up with really good ideas. And they'll analyze the business opportunities and they will find optimal means of delivering them. And they will be profitable. And they just wouldn't do it otherwise, right? But you know, as long as it remains in the hands of charity people, it's mean, not going to work. <laughs> you know? Anyway, we've gone way beyond. This is, this is the longest. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had it in five years. I let it run because it, you know, the conversation needed to, to, to be had. And, and, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chapel. Well, we're going all the way down yeah. there from this. So thank you, thank you very much. It's really been fun. It's been really great. I, you know, these are all the questions that didn't get asked before. You know, it's like the hard questions. I mean, you know, does this make business sense? You know, I mean, and you know, from a, you know, did you think about this? Did you actually talk to other NGOs? And are they, you know, are they sinners as you say they are, and so on? I mean, you know, come on, this is worth talking about. You know. Um, so. Thank you. Thank you. We're back again every Thursday, uh, the 20th of December, and um, we have a speaker on sustainable fishing. We'll send out a call.